complicated, you know, man. It's like a damn Rubik's cube, man. You like talking about that blue red, man. Then you get to one side, then plug it, man. All right, K9. Welcome to the Jay Burden Show. How you doing, man? Yeah, I'm great in yourself, man. Yeah, I'm doing well. So I found your Twitter account, I believe, from a, a friend of mine, Conscious Caracol. He was he was reposting it, and you do some really really interesting stuff. But my audience may not be aware of it. So could you describe, you know, who you are and and what you do? So I'm a average dude, um, essentially. I love my country enough that I don't want it to sound all hero and stuff, but uh, we put our lives on the line um, in order to secure a better future for everybody. And the way we're doing that is through community safety on on the ground uh, itself. So we're not necessarily, how would you put it? We're not necessarily uh, activists in, in that terminology. Uh, we're more frontline troops, if you want to call it, actively fighting crime uh, as citizens in South Africa within the rules and regulations of the South African law, <laughs> T's and C's apply. Um, so, so that's who we are, helping people where we can and how we can. And one of the things that's interesting is that you, know, you, you do work as, as effectively you know, private security, but yeah. your, your, your Twitter account, your online presence is, is cataloging both what you see and you know, posts from, you know, kind of like real crime on the street in yeah. South Africa, which is really fascinating because, you know, from the outside looking in, the types of crime and kind of the, the level of it is very different from, you know, what we experience elsewhere. And so one of the things I want to get into before we jump into that is you talk about, you mentioned that, you know, you're, you're not a government worker. What is the role of private citizens in South Africa when it comes to security? So as far as I'm concerned, and it's just it's my opinion, um, the role should be more than earning a salary and essentially coming home and then sitting on your phone and complaining about the state that everything's in. So I'm obviously not alone in this. Uh, I'm just lucky enough to, to have a, a channel um, that's big enough that people actually take notice and see what's going on. So let's not see Kanan obviously as a hero and he's going out on his own and blah, 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 because I'm not. Um, I'm part of a very, very good team and network of support and individuals who help where and how they can, whether it's local, on the ground or international. So essentially what it looks like is citizens on a security level need to do more. Uh, I mean, we are running in a, in a country that's seeing an, an average of about Last I checked, don't quote me on this, I need to go and double check, but somewhere around 70 to 75 hijackings a day, uh, 80 murders a day. I think 200 odd women are, are raped every day, um, et cetera. And I mean, the list, the list really goes on. And that's not even including, if you want to look at the more controversial things, well, controversial for some, uh, the, the gruesome and brutal farm murders and things like that. And while I can and, and while I'm able, um, I will do more to to help where I can. And the way I can help is on a security level. So I'm sure we'll jump into that in the greater scheme of things in the show. Um, but right now, to give you an idea of what it looks like, uh, short and, and try to the point is you're a citizen of the Republic of South Africa. You have a right to a, a safer uh, country for for all who live in it regardless of who what where and how and you can do your part within the legalities of the law whilst understanding that almost all facets of the law have completely collapsed anyway so you are now the front line and you you got to do your part at the end of the day so that's that's essentially what we're doing if that helps you no definitely i think one of the things that has been interesting in in, in watching that is uh, the the level of violence you know private security in a lot of the mm -hmm. west is effectively kind of you know rent a cops right it's, mm -hmm. it's guys who wear a coat and maybe have a taser and if it's really bad right. they have a gun who just kind of sit right there. and uh, i, I, I mean, saw that uh, uh sorry to cut you off i saw that recently where someone had posted 
at a, a you call them gas stations first it's a petrol station or a garage um a security guard well they called it a security guard a guy standing with a shotgun protecting that uh, gas station for us it's a it's a daily occurrence i mean it's for example south africa's got the biggest private security sector in the world <laughs> to give you an idea of just you know how incorporated into our everyday lives the, the understanding of violence and uh, having to defeat that yeah it's it's not small well and even then i mean I, I hate to say it but i think the reaction you know as even as violent as you know the us is compared to how it was 3 or 4 years ago uh, generally you know if you see private security at a gas station or a petrol station right that's that's abnormal and that's a sign to keep driving right right, <laughs> right. It's, it's, it's okay like, right it's, it's, yeah but yeah what, what, you 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 got a post and it seems like one of the the recurring targets is armored trucks right where they used to, yes. to uh transport valuables and what was interesting yes. to me in this is the aftermath was was four men you know all of whom were maybe in slipshod fashion but still heavily armed who'd been, yes. been killed in this raid. you know trying to take this so yeah so what you're oh right i know what you're referring to so the, the valuables that are being protected so they're called cash and transit heists cits uh for short cash and transit heists and essentially in south africa i, I don't know how it works in the rest of the world but a, a massive part of the economy here uh is, is cold hard cash i mean our informal sector for example, the townships and stuff run off of vast amounts of hard physical uh, currency that you can touch with your hands. They don't want to be doing EFTs and swiping with cards and things like that. A lot of these guys want to rock up and, and pay with cold hard cash. That's just how it is. Um, obviously, it's a way of dodging taxes. It's a way of avoiding the government. It's just that, you know, it is what it is. So what you're seeing there is cash and transit heists. And uh, if you want to, we can go down the road of explaining how it happens quickly and things like that. You let me know. Um, but yeah. Sure. yeah uh, how, do, how do those heists, how are they normally conducted? Right, sorry. I'm not sure how much time you've got and uh, <laughs> the security chat can, can go on forever. So the, the average, we'll start here. So South Africa sees anywhere between sometimes, depending on, I suppose, I don't want to say the month or whatever, but okay, on average, we'll probably see about two cash and transit heists a week. Now we're talking physical armored cash and transit vans getting getting knocked. Um, then you get another version of that, which is your cross pavement uh, hits. The cross pavement is the guy's got the money. It's usually on this little trolley thing in a uh, either in cases or like a vinyl blue bag type thing. Uh, and that's dragged across and, and put into the armored van. So that's your cross pavement. You sometimes see more of those than the actual cash and transit heist itself because it's easier. Um, and then you get your ATM bombings. So ATM bombings, we must see easily about four a week if I'm just looking at my stats uh, on my side. So an ATM uh, bombing is very similar to cash and transit heist. The methods are the same except they're not obviously ramming the, the ATM. So they're using explosives uh, to gain access to both the, the cash and transit armored van uh, and the ATM itself. Those explosives are usually the, the forbidden sausage. So the forbidden sausage is uh, mining explosives. It's in the shape of a, a sausage. And I mean, you take notes while we do this, so I can send you uh, all the links just now so that you can load them and you can show people exactly what we're talking about because it's always nice to give people a visual interpretation it's mining explosives that are used by obviously the mining industry but primarily um <laughs> what what one of the guys coined uh, as artisanal miners which is our zama zamas illegal gold miners and they they are getting these uh, illegal uh, mining explosives from places like mozambique zimbabwe sometimes Botswana, um, even as uh, as far as um, places like, uh, just trying to think now, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the Congo and stuff like that. So they take 
these explosives and, and they've got a guy, everyone in the team specializes in something. So if you're looking at a cash and chance at highest, you're looking at teams of between 15 to 30 people that are all involved on the scene. So, and these are all heavily, heavily, heavily armed individuals. Um, most of them will carry AKs, R1s, R4s, LM5s. Where we've seen Galils. We've seen, uh, there was even a, a scene where they had a, a full blown RPK, um, which, you know, is, this is like Russian era stuff. And essentially the armored van will be driving along. I mean, they'll plan this for months and armored van will be driving along and they'll ram the van off the road with the vehicle. They hijack the vehicle, obviously, for that purpose. Um, they try to target European-ish style vehicles, so they tend to re really enjoy ramming with BMWs and Mercedes and things like that because, the, according to them, uh, it's a safer car to ram with because, obviously, the guy ramming doesn't want to die or he doesn't want to get captured. And... Once that van is rammed off the road or blocked in or, or, or whatever, they will then engage the, the vehicle. Um, there's that famous video of Leo Prince Lua having his shootout, uh, the very first, one of the very first South African cash and transit styled videos that went viral when they were shooting at his vehicle and then he disembarks and engages them and whatever. That's really what it's like, except he, he's obviously got the training uh, and understanding to keep moving through the, the firefight. A lot of the cash and chance of guys, they just do not stand a chance. It's four to six guys, depending on what they're doing. Um, you've got a driver, a, a passenger, and either two or three guys in, in the back, sometimes four guys in the back, depending. And sometimes those guys will be armed uh, with rifles, high-powered rifles, or they might just be given handguns. There are instances when they're just given revolvers. So you take all that into a consideration they don't stand a chance firstly um secondly there isn't really a support structure for them it's not really as if they've got a convoy of heavily armed humvees pulling in behind them you know to engage as if we're driving the green mile in, in iraq or uh, libya benghazi sort of vibe it's, it's just not happening so the, the vehicle gets rammed off the road the cash and chance van now these guys have to disembark and engage and and for the most part they'll surrender because you find that if they don't surrender immediately, chances of the whole crew getting wiped or, or at least some of them getting uh, killed is very high. The guys will walk up and, and they will just shoot them dead, even after they've surrendered, if there's been a prolonged firefight, because they want that level of fear. They want that level of violence so that the next van that gets hit, they know full well that, hey, if we don't surrender now, uh, we're going to die. Um, the other side of that coin is they can't trust each other inside that cash and chance van. A lot of them are involved in these, these heists because they're getting a share of the money. Um, there's a very good book that I'll, I'll find for you. I must make a note here that, that goes into very, very good detail. And it explains clearly that the one time the armored van was rammed off the road, it rolled. The guy reached up to grab his LM5 because uh, they're, they're mounted on the walls to take it off the wall and the guy who's not supposed to grab the lm5 grabbed it and pointed it at him and he understood immediately that the game was up and that his own partner was was in on it there was also a famous case of violence where they poured petrol and stuff straight into the cab uh, and set it on fire so things like that uh, there are instances when they hit the van and um if you if the driver because I mean, it's an armored van he doesn't open the door to to get out or anything like that they'll blow the van up with him in it well there was even a case where they had a picture of the guy's family and they just put the picture up on the window and i mean what do you do then yeah, you put your hands up man you know you walk away and you hope they don't shoot you in the back of the head on the way out so th that's what south africa is seeing um it's so bad that they're bringing rakes you know garden rakes that you rake up your leaves with they're bringing those to the cash and chance at high scene so they can rake up the money when the van blows up, because the money goes everywhere. And then you've seen the outcome, if you've seen some of my videos, it's always the same. The, the public swarms the scene. They absolutely swarm it from, whether they're in a car, if they're coming out of their houses, they're coming right out of the bush, I swear some of them pop out of the ground. Um, 
and they're grabbing as much money as they absolutely can uh, and, and trying to, to get away with it. To hell with their own lives. I mean, we've had several instances where secondary explosives have gone off and killed people, and there's bits of human meat flying everywhere from the bomb blast, but more people pour in to grab what money, what money they can. So that's what it looks like. Um, and as I say, we are seeing, if you're looking at hard cash and transit heists, South Africa is probably seeing about two a week. Sometimes we see three a week. Um, our worst week, I think we had literally one a day. In terms of ATM bombings, easily five to six a week. Cross pavement, three to four a week. Um, and that's, yeah, that's that's what it looks like in terms of the cash and transit side. It's It's hectic, man. Fun and games. Make a note here for the book for you, so don't forget. No, not at all. And, and it's interesting you bring up that that video because I think that's one that you know I, I remember very very well. And, and obviously, right. you know that that guy was a, a stud. He knew exactly what he was going to do. But I mean, uh, that situation that you're talking about, where it's guys who don't necessarily have the equipment, the training, or even the trust in between each other to get out of it, is is sort of it's an unenviable situation. Right. So what are the other? I wouldn't do that job. That's for sure. Right, Sorry, I, I absolutely. Yeah, I, I would not do that job. That's a that's for damn sure. Not I a mean, job. You're a sitting duck, right? You're a sitting duck. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the other crimes that you you catalog often is is copper wire theft, and this is right. something you see everywhere. You know, it happens in the U.S., albeit at a much much smaller scale. But mm -hmm. uh, to what degree is is this affecting the actual delivery of power in South Africa? Is it that big of a problem or is it just an opportunistic crime? So it's, it's massive. It's gotten worse in the last six to eight years, uh, closer to five years, but we'll give it a broader spectrum. We'll be fair because I don't want it to seem like canine is just, you know, saying that South Africa is apocalyptic. Um, to discuss copper cable theft, we have to sort of start at the beginning and finish at the end of a very long story which i will do my best to make short and, and to the point here um don't want your listeners to fall asleep so essentially we'll start off with i used to talk about cable theft until an american messaged me and the guy was like they're stealing your tv signals over there and i was like what <laughs> so i didn't know that in america obviously you guys have what you call cable tv and he's like why is it such a big thing over there? Why are people dying over stuff like this? And and then I realized nobody's talking about copper cable theft. And I felt like such a moron. So to cover this from start to finish and help everybody out here, essentially it starts with load shedding, something we've got uh, that we call load shedding. It's, it's rolling blackouts is the correct international term, but our country government coined the word load shedding. So that doesn't sound so bad. It's rolling blackouts every day. Uh, our power stations, which are ancient now, these power stations are old. They were last built um, in the 19 foot sacks, God knows when, and they're struggling. So power stations lose uh, their, their output and obviously they have to balance the grid. You've got to keep it within certain hertz. I think South Africa is 50 hertz or something. Um, and the way they do that is by limiting access to electrical power to vast areas at a time and that is what the load shedding is so every day every south african uh, has a list and in that list is defined blocks for your <clears throat> excuse me for your area and and those those blocks um trying to multitask sorry those those blocks will then not have access to power for a given amount of time so it can either be between two hours, four hours, uh, sometimes um, even six hours, which was like a one sort of thing. And how that looks, I promise you I'm getting to the point of copper cable theft, but we need to understand it from the start here. It is a twisted thing, unfortunately. What happens there is that it, almost every South African makes use of an app. There's so many apps out there on your phone, normal cell phone apps that help us keep uh, on point with the schedules because you can't track it. It's impossible. And you're as a good guy, you're using the app. The bad guy next to you is using the app as well. For you, it's you so you can plan your life so that you know when you get home, can I make dinner now? Can I not? <clears throat> can I charge my phone? You know, can I do all these stupid little things that 
you would think you would have access to in a country that's working. For the bad guy next to you, he's looking at him going, oh, it's a menu. And he can now decide, okay, the power is going to be off in this area this time. So I'm going to hit this area for their copper cable. Then I'm going to get out of dodge. And he knows he's going to be okay because the power is literally turned off. So essentially what protects your copper cable? It's the live electrical current running through it. That's all that's protecting it, really. Um, so with regards to that copper cable theft, that, that's where it starts. Where it ends is it depends on what's happening. So you have syndicates. You have groups that, that just want to get lucky. You, you have your average hobo, bum, homeless guy, whatever, uh, who wants a, a quick hit. So he, he goes and uh, gets himself some copper cable. Or you have a guy who's genuinely trying to feed his family because he's desperate enough that he's got no choice. Um, and then you've got another side of that spectrum, which we'll get to now, which they call the, the Izanyorkas. Those are the guys who steal cable for the sole purpose of, of repurposing it into electrical connections for their illegal shacks and pandukas and little um, things in the middle of nowhere. So is it bad? Yeah. Um, are they stealing a lot of it? A ton. Absolutely. I mean, for my on my area alone, we were at some stage seeing about 100 meters being stolen every single week. And that's not in one go. That's in various uh, places, all dug up. Doesn't sound like a lot, but if you factor in the average guy is taking maybe a meter or two at a time, um, for the American listeners, that's about one American eagle and a half, depending on how he's standing. If it's from beak to tail, I don't know, but we'll figure it out. <laughs> um, essentially, he's, he's taking like an American eagle's <laughs> length worth of, of copper cable at a time. That is an absolute metric shit ton of, of work that's been put in to get the stuff out of the ground. And it's affecting people's lives because now the system is under strain. People go without power for hours, days, sometimes weeks, depending on how bad it is. And everyone keeps saying, pour concrete over it. Well, they can't do that because then uh, if there's a short in the line, we have a lot of shorts, by the way, they can't repair it. Then they say, okay, lay aluminum cable. Well, it's branded as alu cable. We can't stick alu cable in the ground because if the guy's digging for copper cable and he finds alu cable, he still pulls it out anyway. He can still sell it or he can reuse it and give it to the Izanyorkas who will then, as I say, repurpose it for, for what they want to power. Um, so it's bad. How it usually works is the guys will rock up. You'll see those nice trenches that I post. It's because you find that their line of work during the day is actual trenching, whether they are trenching for fiber lines or trenching for electrical cables or trenching for other municipal services such as water, sewerage, uh, whatever, maybe they're construction guys, whatever, you'll find that those trenches are always beautifully neatly dug. I mean, they're almost like you could turn it into a fighting position, essentially, if you wanted to. Um, so they dig really quickly. They, you can get crews of up to 30, 40 guys at a time. I kid you not. Even bigger than the cash and transit heists. And, and that's obviously the syndicate level now. They'll dig up and then those guys will pull serious amounts of copper from the ground and load it up in a truck. The smaller groups are essentially digging up four, five, six, eight meters at a time. And they'll cut it up into just under a meter long lengths and they shove it into a backpack and then off they go. And you'll see they cut the, 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 the outer sheath and then they pull those metal wires away because it's got an armored core around it. A lot of my international followers see that armored core and they say, no, but it's aluminum. It's not. That's just... Uh, it's it's wire. It's just normal normal wire that that is around it. That's there to protect the cable, make it you know armored or whatever. They strip it in the trench because it lowers the weight and it makes it easier to repurpose later on. They then set the cable on fire to burn away the plastic and the rubber and the waterproofing uh, coatings and, and blah blah blah. Then leaves them with this beautiful sh uh, uh, copper core which is often, it's either a, a thick, solid copper core, or it's twisted, it doesn't matter, and that they then melt down and sell. Um, and the final end of that process is it goes to illicit <coughs> copper scrap metal yard dealers. Um, a lot of people say, yeah, but shut down the dealers, but you can't because the average neighborhood has a bunch of them. Every single neighborhood in this country 
even if it looks like a fancy house, I promise you I can go into almost any neighborhood and I will find you a scrap metal dealer that's using uh, that neighborhood as a way to, to get the copper. And from there, it can go anywhere. Um, it can be reused within South Africa, obviously sold illicitly, reused, put into actual certified, I don't know, certified products. Um, or in most cases, it actually crosses our borders, goes to Mozambique, and then it's shipped to China or something. Now, the other side of that coin is getting to the violence part again. We're finding that the copper cable thieves are, are more armed. They are more willing to return or not return fire because by law you can't just fire upon them. Sorry, the correct terminology um, would be they, they are more willing to open fire on you first. Uh, it could be, you know, before they would just run away. They would abandon everything and they would run away. Now they're openly engaging first responders. Um, they're also being more brazen. They're taking this stuff in broad daylight. We're talking busy traffic people just watch and that's the thing and you asked earlier in the beginning you know what are we doing why are we doing it it's because no one else is so people will watch them dig up the cable and then they'll go onto twitter or onto their phones and they'll complain and make a scene and it's like come on man you know do do something tell someone who can come out and make a difference um so yeah sorry i joined on a bit there i do apologize it's just when you discuss the whole security thing in south africa it's always unfortunately there's a start and a finish to everything, and it's just one big um, convoluted mess that we're all trying to navigate, I suppose. No, no, not at all. I mean, I, I asked because I was interested in your answer. I think that I really became aware of this because obviously anytime you're you're kind of uh, working with, you know, like industrial electrical cable, right, there are always accidents, especially if you're doing what they are. And so I, yes. I've seen these these videos of just like horribly burned people. You yeah, know, like terrifying toasted. electrical burns. Yeah, completely. Yeah, and absolutely toasted. Obviously, on one hand, it's horrifying. On the other hand, it's like, well, you can only feel so bad for someone who decided to take right. a to a right. table, right? That's the thing, right, exactly. Um, I think you're so on point there, and it's important people discuss that. It's also, I look at it and I go, okay, but you, you stole cable, um, and now you've affected the whole neighborhood and South Africans are so, we use the word gutful. They've, they've had enough. They are tired of things. They're, they're gutful. They've had enough. They're, they're, you know, um, they've just had it. And you find more South Africans are looking at things like this and going, but why did he survive? He should have just died. And it's unfortunate because I find myself on the, myself on the same path. It's not that you're being inhumane or anything like that. Um, but you have had enough. If you, I mean, for example, I, I spoke to a Texas friend of mine. He's got a baby and everything, and he couldn't possibly imagine what it's like to not have access to electricity when you need it, especially if the government themselves is taking that electricity away from you. And for him, it was like, but how the hell does he then look after his child? How does he feed it? Um, I don't know. You know, all these things you got to do with, with a kiddo, it's impossible. So people have genuinely had enough. And now you're, you're starting to see that in action, uh, especially with things like water. I mean, we're going a little bit off topic there, but water, for example, some of the protests we're seeing now um, are because people haven't had access to water for days, weeks, again, sometimes months. I mean, how do you freaking live like that? It's impossible. And then I have to still contend with guys coming over my wall who want to take my stuff and I mean, not just take my stuff, but, and I mean, look, I've always believed you've got to be honest and straightforward with these sort of things. They, they would be more than, than willing to essentially rape your wife, tie you up, have a cigarette and go for round two whilst you watch, and then they'll still shoot you on the way out. So they want that trauma. They want that level of violence and things like that. Um, this is what we're, what we're trying to stop. Well, and, and I think that, and I, and I won't try and, and, butcher your term but that feeling of just being fed up is is something that i mean it's very human it's very natural because if you're the kind yeah. of guy who who is has a you know relatively moral outlook on life right who right who views like okay my role is to to build for the next generation to do what absolutely is correct. and someone right. is not only you know harming your ability to do that but you know, looking for any opening 
to basically bring everything back down to kind of like enforce this level of barbarism. I mean, mm -hmm. the first time maybe you feel bad, but after a while, it's just like, why do we have to live like this? Like, why do I have to be subjected to this kind of behavior? And I think it's incredibly Absolutely. frustrating for, for people in countries that used to work, right? Like, look, like America's Absolutely. always had problems. America's always been on a relative level more violent than places like Europe has, you know, right. I'm not going to hide. Right. That. But at the same time, it's like, you know, even within living memory, you know, pre-1968, we did not have the level of violence we have now. You know, even 20 years ago, we didn't have the violence we have now. And right. again, it's it's not nearly at the level that you're experiencing. But at the same time, it shouldn't be. You know, it, we shouldn't have to live like this. And so, you know, you mentioned the home invasions. And I think that's the thing that's perhaps the most the most chilling, again, is to see right. you know, security videos of, of guys, you know, jumping the fence, you know, sneaking yeah. behind, you know, garage doors. And, and I may have mm -hmm. mentioned this earlier, but I think one of the things that really drew my attention to your account was, was you posting about cell phone jammers and how they have been used in crime. So do you want to explain, you know, why a cell phone jammer is a scary thing? And then also okay. kind of their, their, their rise to prominence. So they're, they're basically signal, signal jammers. Um, I have a, another friend who I wish I could have brought him on. He's, he's, he's a professor of the dark arts, essentially. He's like Snape in, in Harry Potter. The, the dude, when it, when it comes to all things that requires signal, uh, he's an absolute wizard. I mean, it scares the living hell out of me what he can do. But yeah, he would be great for this topic. Uh, I'll put you in touch with him if you ever want to go you know, in a deep dive, I think you should try and bring him on the show. I know you would enjoy it. I'll, I'll give you a heads up when we're done. Um, but essentially they come in depending on the type. So as far as I understand, you get eight, eight antenna versions, 16 antenna versions, and 26 or, or 28 antenna versions. And for the most part, they run off of a 12 volt uh, system. So they, they plug into the, the 12 volt uh, cigarette lighter in the car, or the guys will man pack them. So they make them portable where a man can carry it in a backpack. They put a gate motor battery in the, in the backpack and they plug it in uh, in that way. And you're seeing that a lot in things like farm attacks um, and home invasions, like you've just mentioned. One, it, it cuts out the cell phone signal, so you cannot call for help. Two, it can cut out, depending on the type of output it's got, it can cut out the transmission of radios. So a lot of your, your Beertwach systems, your neighborhood watch systems, um, or your Plaaswach, your farm watch uh, systems and things like that, we rely solely on communication. I mean, it's they're, they're like military systems and these guys need to be able to communicate effectively in order to survive, basically. If you cannot communicate, <clears throat> it's game over for you. So they cut out all forms of communication depending on the type. And we're even seeing them affect uh, security cameras that run off of Wi-Fi because some of them have the capability to block Wi-Fi. What they're used mostly in though, and um, yes, they are used in home invasions um, that are violent and farm attacks, but they're mostly used in cases uh, such as cash and transit heists, because then the cash and transit guy's panic doesn't work or he can't radio base for help properly or anyone near can't really do much, or uh, they're used mostly in the hijacking of cars because then it jams the tracking system uh, inside that vehicle. Now, they don't have a lot of range depending on the unit. So those little ones you normally see, it comes in, it's got like a little, looks like a neoprene um, pouch that it sits in with a little single flap that flaps over the front. The typical one that people see, it's usually in like a, FDE, khaki, olive green sort of color. Um, those ones don't have a big range. Maybe if it were to block something, it would block the average like garage worth of, of space for like a single vehicle or two vehicles sort of thing. Uh, the bigger ones, especially in that one famous picture that goes around of that farm attack, and I'll make a note here to find you that, 
that image. Um, that one most likely could uh, block that whole household very, very easily. And that was a proper military grade system that that guy had on his back. And we're not just using the word military grade and throwing it around here. Um, he had a proper, proper system on his back. Let me just make a note here, farm attack, um, jammer, and I can send you that link. Um, so yes, they've risen to, to prominence. Um, the way I see it, I don't, I don't want people to, you know, be afraid of them. Um, I know, I know that when the Americans see it, I've noticed that they have a habit of, it either goes one of two ways. One, it goes, holy shit, we're all going to die. Or two, well, screw him. It doesn't block lead, so I'm going to be okay. That's the side that I want people to be on. I want people to look at a jammer and go, okay, and? Because for me personally, it doesn't change anything. If, if anything were, were to go down, for example, in my household, the first thing I do is throw my phone at, at my wife. I'm armed to the teeth. And I go through the necessary in order to ensure my family safety. My wife immediately knows, open my phone, start calling. She knows exactly who to call on, on, on that list. Um, and, you know, our communication and all that uh, is there. If she can't call because the signal's jammed, for me at that moment in time, it, it doesn't make a difference. And I don't want it to make a difference to, to anyone else. Um, if that makes sense, because they're already there. They're already over your wall. They're probably already in your house. And whether the signal's being jammed at that point in time, in that moment of time in your life, it, it makes no tangible difference if you think about it. If you're getting shot at, um, unless you're trained, you're not, the average guy is not gonna reach for his phone and start phoning for help. He's gonna haul ass and he's gonna try and get away from that fire, or he's gonna return fire um, step off the X, you know, all those things that they teach you, stay in the fight essentially is what he's going to do. And you use the people around you. So if I toss the phone at my wife and she can't make a call because the signal's blocked, well, well then so be it. Um, that's okay because then those guys can't phone for help either. And, and that Texas guy uh, had a fantastic outlook on it because he's like, well, it can't block lead. And the bad guys can't call for help either. So nobody knows you're here, buddy. <laughs> that, that sort of vibe. And that's, that's what I, I want people to take away from this conversation, if at all possible. Um, yes, jammers are bad and things like that. But just, yeah, stay, stay in the fight. It's not going to block lead, if that helps. So I think that you're 100% right on the attitude necessary to overcome that, right? I think that it, it's an interesting development because it, it signals the amount of preparation that goes into this, right? In the U.S., the majority of home break-ins are not particularly sophisticated, right? It, it's right. Some, some junkie with a crowbar, you know, someone wants your TV, you know, it's right. not exactly rocket science. You know, there's not a lot of right. free planning that goes into it. And so I think that that's, the, that's, that's why that piece of tech is interesting, well, especially in a, in a place where I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a relatively expensive piece of kit, at least as far as I understand, right? The real military grade one. So that, that's another interesting dynamic as well. It's like, where does the, the money for such a thing come from? So how do people in South Africa go about, you know, securing themselves? You, know, you mentioned, obviously, that there is, you know, people have walls, people will have cameras. What is, what is sort of considered normal? And then, you know, obviously you've mentioned you know, firearms and firearms training, is that something that's viewed as normal? Like are people sort of taking their own uh, protection into their own hands, so to speak? Right. So when you look at safety, security in South Africa and what people are doing, the norm for South Africa is high walls. Uh, I would, I don't know, I'd estimate the walls at what, eight to 10 feet high, depending um, two meters, usually two and a half meters, sometimes more. On top of that wall, they've then got spikes. And then on top of that, they've got uh, electric fencing. It's usually six, eight, or 10 strands, depending. Um, and then they've got security cameras. The houses, the houses are, are usually locked up like a fort. So you've got burglar bars. You've got slam lock gates that, that lock the moment you, you slam them shut. Um, and then they've got home alarm systems. 
And then if they can afford it, they've got a security company on call that they can press a panic or phone or WhatsApp for uh, immediate assistance. Now, that's the average South African. Unfortunately, the average South African is not armed, though. And the average South African, sure as shit, does not train for eventual outcomes. So this is why you're also seeing, for example, how some farm attacks can become so bloody and violent and deadly all uh, at the same time. And then you hear that the attackers left with multiple firearms from that farm. It's because they were likely caught off guard. The guns were locked away in a safe. Um, well, the person who had the firearms just didn't train enough with it to be proficient in its use um, when push came to shove. So the average South African, unfortunately, doesn't really train or do the necessary to understand that are you willing to meet that guy's level of violence on the same level and more? Because if you want to stop that threat that's in your household, you have to, um, you have to meet that same level of violence. I mean, like I've said to my wife, and please excuse the, the language here, but she mustn't be surprised that when he's dead, you know, I'm still going to skull fuck him sort of thing. That's just how it is. Uh, you have to continuously, continuously understand that, as you said, your side of the world, they're going to break in. The guy's going to grab your TV and he's going to haul ass out of there. For us, it's totally different story. We know that once they break in, the TV and all that stuff comes lost. They're looking for the owners of the household. They're looking for the bedrooms where the children are, where the parents are sleeping. They've already poisoned your dog before they've come over the wall. Um, now they've tied up the, the husband, they've tied up the wife, they've tied up the kids. They make the kids watch while, and I don't know, sorry, how, let me stop you. How deep do you want to go into this? <laughs> you, you're good. Whatever, whatever you feel needs to be said. Okay, cool. Because it's a nice, I'm glad you've given me a moment of your time and your platform. And I do appreciate it because if people can understand how violent South Africa truly is, it helps a lot. So they, they, will put, they will rape your wife, okay? They'll make the kids watch. There are instances where they'll make the kids rape each other or they'll make the kids rape the mom. Now, South Africans will hear this. They'll read about this. They'll talk about this. They'll know about it. But they won't step up and go, okay, let me go and purchase a firearm. Let me become proficient in its use, let me keep it on me on a, on a daily basis and not leave it in the safe, for example. Um, and it's so frustrating to try and get this message across to people that when it happens, if you haven't prepared for it, it's too late. So this is what it looks like in South Africa. They've got all these, you know, we're living in, in jail cells essentially to keep ourselves safe, but they won't go the next step to legally arm themselves, train, and then be ready for, for that level of, of violence. Because that's, that's the country we live in. It's beautiful, please. I don't want anyone listening to this to turn around and go, holy shit, you know, if my plane is flying over South Africa, I'm gonna hijack it and make sure the guy goes the other way. No, visit our beautiful country, please. It's stunning. There are parts of this place that are like no other in this entire world. But know that you must take the required steps to survive because we are more violent than your average country. It just is what it is. I hope, I hope that helps cover that part. Um, to, to top that part off, it's not like we haven't said to people, for example, I've got a, 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 like a, almost like a program of mine where I help people free of charge. If you want to get a firearm legally and you want to operate and use it within the limitations of South African law, I will help you with the process from start to finish, no matter where you are in South Africa. All you do is you buy it. I put you in touch with the right people, your side of the world, who will help you through the process. Um, and when you're done, you're done. It's, you know, if I can't help you, I will put you in touch with the guys who can. And we don't charge for that. We don't charge an absolute cent. So that's that's where we are, man, unfortunately. We're, we're living in jail cells knowing that, not all of us, but knowing that when the time comes, what are they actually going to do? Well, and I think that one of the things that I noticed and was really inspiring to me about the about you know your countrymen is this would have been I want to say 2021 or 2022. There were a, a large 
number of riots in in South Africa. And and effectively, at least what I saw in the media was that in these sort of neighborhood watch groups, you know, banded together and basically formed, you know, armed lines, basically like you will not cross. Right. So there were these, you know, incredibly dramatic videos of of running gunfights. And shortly right. after or shortly before, I don't have the exact timeline in my head, the government had basically announced that it was going to try and restrict you know, the access of citizens to guns, right? To remove self-defense right. as a legitimate reason. Right. Yes. And I think that obviously, you know, you've mentioned that the South African government is to a certain degree ineffectual, right? Their 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 control is slipping. But yes. I think it's hard to look at a situation like that. And obviously similar things have happened with my government. And basically say like, okay, they know what they're doing, right? They they mm -hmm. know whose side they're on, who their voters are. And so what are the the sort of you know restrictions on protecting yourself in South Africa? I realize there's probably a difference between what's on the books and what actually happens. And also, mm -hmm. like, is your government signaling that they're trying to get rid of those those protections? So I can touch on the topic. Unfortunately, as per uh, the firearm laws, there's a whole lot of legislation and things like that where there are guys who, because I'll never pretend to be something I'm not, there are guys who are a lot more well-versed in that, but I will touch on it. Um, so essentially uh, our government, so look, we're, we're fucked, but we're free. So you say our government is, is they're losing their overreach and things like that, which for the average citizen is good. Um, in your case, not so good because, you know, your government's just got way too much grab from what we see. So if on our side of the coin, it's a different story. You know, the more control they lose, the better it is for me actually in the long term, because then I just get left alone to fix things on my own, which is fine. That's exactly what I want. Um, so essentially in, in terms of firearm law in South Africa, it's another long story, but we'll be trying to be quick again. I don't want to drone on, uh, um, basically you get different licenses. Your primary is a section 13, which is your self-defense license. And then you get your different levels of like, fifth level, uh, sorry, section 15, section 16 and, and others, which are like sports shooting, dedicated sports, dedicated hunting, blah, blah, blah. On your section 13, you can only own 200 rounds of ammunition. Okay. Think about that for a second. That's probably uh, way less than what the average American shoots out just, you know, eating his breakfast in the morning. Um, <laughs> on your section 16, theoretically, the the ammunition that you can keep is is unlimited. I'm not sure about the other licenses. So again, I'm not going to dive into stuff I'm not 100% sure on. Um, with regards to the law, your safe must be bolted to the, the wall or the floor, preferably both if at all possible. And obviously, you must have control over that firearm at all times. Um, South Africa doesn't do carry permits like I see in the US. It took me a long time to figure out what all that was. So in South Africa, it's one rule. If you own a firearm, it must be concealed at all times, unless it's being used for business purposes, such as uh, security work. It's a whole different legislation, protection work, whatever. Then you can carry open, but that's usually in the case of a rifle, a shotgun. You see where I'm going like, with this. You don't want to carry your nine mil around in your hand because then everyone knows that you're wrong. But I mean, if you walk out with the rifle, you've got your bulletproof vest on already, you may as well. So that's sort of where that goes. In terms of acquiring a firearm, it can take you six months to a year. Some people have waited two years uh, to get that firearm in their hands. So the process there, another quick one, walk into the gun store, buy your, your handgun. You then have to do your two different competencies. The first competency is uh, the practical use of a firearm and then the law side of it. Second competency is just to go to the police station, pay them 60 Rand, whatever the cost is now, and they give you a printed piece of paper. Hear this, a printed piece of paper six to eight months later. Okay, It's something they can just give you then and there, essentially. When that's done, you then have to, to do your actual application, which then goes to usually Pretoria or wherever, and then you can wait a year, six months, depending. And then when that comes back, they say, okay, you've got your license, your card is coming, the card then takes another four to eight weeks, depending. Um, and then once that physical plastic card is in your hands, you can then walk back to the gun store, go inside and take that, that firearm. 
I've spoken to a lot of Americans about this. And it's funny because they're like, yeah, but when I go and buy a gun, I buy it and I walk out with it. And they're like, so you're telling me that you go in, you spend money on a firearm, and you come back sometimes two years later to pick it up, not because you took so long, but because you followed the process and the law that's in place. Yes, that is how it happens. Uh, in terms of using that handgun actively for self-defense, there are three things that have to take place at the same time. One, the attack must be ongoing. Two, it must be life-threatening. Uh, uh, and three, it must be unlawful in nature. So you cannot preemptively attack someone, essentially, depending on what the court looks at, in, in order to, you know, save something. But if someone is attacking your family or your friend or yourself, they've got a knife in their hand or a gun, um, and you meet those three criteria, then then take your shot. But now, as you and I both know, these attacks are instantaneous. And you have to now magically throw the fairy dust in the air and and hope that you're within the rule of law when you when you engage. If he jumps over your wall of your property, you cannot shoot him. If he is on the other side of your gate and he is um, opening fire on you inside the, the household, it depends. The court might look at you returning fire as, but could you not have gone somewhere else in the house? Or two, um, you know, it's sorry, it's a whole long thing. So essentially, he's got to go over your wall, break into your house, uh, and then charge at you inside your house. Then essentially, you can engage him. That is now, but pretty much so the very short part of how South African firearm law works. It's not exact. What I've given you, unfortunately, is not the exact uh, requirements for it. It's just the basics as far as. I understand it from reading the law myself. There are guys who are much well versed in that, which I'd happily put you in touch with if you wanted, uh, and they can give you proper proper rundowns on that. Well, definitely. <laughs> I think that one of the, one of the things that I'm curious about, because this is a, a problem we definitely have in the U.S., is that of sort of activist judges, right? That you could be by the letter of the law completely morally justified, but if uh, you know someone from, let's just say, a, a, a blue city wants to make their name, they, they will sort of drag you through the courts, even if it's completely justified. I mean, very, you know, very famously, this is essentially what happened to Rittenhouse, right? Rittenhouse's case was right. open and shut. Right. And he was very yeah. lucky that he had effectively the world's sole remaining, you know, 75-year-old Andy Griffith judge in, uh, yes. <laughs> in his courthouse. So is that yes. a problem you see in South Africa or is the, the rule of law not nearly as important? So the way I understand it is we don't necessarily have all, all of that that you just spoken about. So we don't really do the citizen judge activist, blah, blah, blah thing. There are a few activists that are really good at, at, at what they do. Um, we've got several activists who are fighting hard for, for our firearm uh, rights and things like that. They're a lot like, um, the FPC on your side of the world. I think they're the Firearms Policy Coalition or something. I don't know if I can say that on your show, but um, they're a lot like them fighting for the, the rights of firearm owners, which we are eternally grateful for, and we will support them with whatever you know the guys on our side need. But in the same token, we've got other guys, for example, like Gun Free SA, who expect us to just hand over our firearms and phone the bloody police when we need anything. The same police force that is absolutely non-existent, the same police force that probably shoots out maybe five rounds every six months in terms of their practice. And can you imagine that? That's insane. Um, so, so yeah, no, we don't, we don't, luckily for us, yeah, thank God, we don't have sort of all those issues that you have where any Tom, Dick and Harry can put up their hand and, and sort of take you on about it. For, for us, the, the rule of law, um, I'll give you a perfect example to this. I'll give you a perfect example to this. There was a, a cash and transit heist um, out in the middle of nowhere, farmland. I can't remember exactly where. You've got to forgive me for this. I didn't plan this whole thing. Um, there was a cash and transit heist now recently in last year. And the local farm watch, the local Plaaswach, Beertwach, whatever, picked up their rifles and the farmers literally jumped in helicopters tracked those guys down 
engaged and killed them. Okay, they took them out in action whilst they were being engaged. Not one farmer um, was injured. And the police were there with them, and the police allowed them to act within accordance to the law. And at that time, they were supporting the police in their duties. They're chasing heavily, heavily armed tangos who were armed with R1s or R4s or LM5s, whatever, AKs. And they engaged them and they shot back and they killed all of them. There were like four or six guys that were shot dead. It was a very, very big thing. I spoke to those guys. They are very close with their local police station. Their local police station essentially thanked them for their help. They thanked them for their continued support. And everyone, for lack of a better understanding, went on their went on their own ways, their own directions. Obviously, there'll be investigations and things like that, but no one is being targeted or unnecessarily hounded for the actions that they took that day because they've got a good understanding with their local police station. They help them, they support them, they set up roadblocks when needed, they help them take down the bad guys as we saw there. I mean, the costs just to get that helicopter in the air and to fly it, I mean, that must be astronomical. Um, but they did that to support the local police force. And they took out the bad guys in the process. They shot them dead, which I'm all for, 100%. So the South African law, unfortunately, we, we are at a, a point where it just depends essentially on who you piss off on that day um, when you take action, really. But if you're within the rules and the rights of the law, um, you'll be okay. You know, a lot of people say, I'm not going to get a firearm because I'm going to go to jail when I use it. No. Just understand the law, train with it, be proficient, you'll be fine. So that I hope that sums that up. Well, definitely, man. That was genuinely fascinating. Thank you so much for, for coming on the show. But if people want to find you know, more of you and your work, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, they can they can take a look at my, my ex-Twitter page. Um, you can pop up a, a Twitter tag for me on the show. If you don't mind, it would be appreciated. And obviously, when the show comes out, please let me know and pop it to me in a, the link in a DM so I can share for you. And yeah, essentially, my account, if I may, it might look a bit doom and gloom, but I, I promise you it's not to the, the listener. It's just there essentially to show people what's going on. But whilst understanding that there is a better future for us here in South Africa, um, I, I like my country. I want to stay, I want to help the people who are here, and I want to build it and make it a safer place for everybody who is here. And it's possible, but the community support must pull together and people must push through. Otherwise, we're just going to let crime overrun it and we will, you know, essentially never, ever get anything right. So that's what my account does. Um, in the future, you'll see there's a bunch of new things coming with regards to community safety and stuff like that. And yeah, it's time we got people involved. Definitely, man. I think that that's an important message and uh, I look forward to, to good things from your account. Uh, I'll be sure to link that down in the description. I, I highly recommend it. As far as my stuff, you guys can find this podcast on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, anywhere you listen to podcasts. I also have a sub stack where you can find my more long form content. And if you want to support the show, the best way to do that is Axios Remote Fitness and Coaching. Axios is a, is a great service. I'm in the, the private group chat with all the members there all the time talking about preparedness, fitness, and uh, JD, the owner, is incredible at what he does. And if you subscribe, you get to have access to his wealth of knowledge. Cannot recommend it enough. But again, K9, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. No, thank you. I honestly, honestly appreciate your time. And uh, if I droned on a bit, <laughs> my apologies, man. It's just uh, very passionate about what we're doing in South Africa to try and make things right. Not at all, man. This was this was great, and I'm sure everyone enjoyed it. And everyone at home, remember, keep your head up. The lie can't last forever. Good night.